My name is Tom Pullum, and I'm going to be the director of Phantom here at the Westchester Broadway Theater. And I thought this time I'd like to learn a little bit more about Phantom, so I went to interview Maury Yeston, the composer. It's great to see you. Oh, Thanks it's great to see you, too. Us. I'm so thrilled about this production. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Well, you know what? Let's start with you a little bit. Did you always want to be a Tony-nominated and winning composer for Broadway? You know, I, 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 that's not the way it happened. I mean, I, my mother played the piano, and when I was about five years old, I just went to the piano, and I figured it out, and I started playing what she was playing. And so she uh, just uh, drew the with a pencil the names, the letters on the, on the keys so I could learn the letters. And I guess I started taking lessons when I was six, but even as soon as I was six, I started writing music. I, did, I, mean, I didn't know that you shouldn't. And then I guess I was probably, must have been about 11 years old, and uh, they took me to see My Fair Lady with uh -huh. Julian Rex, and that was it for me. I just, you know, I knew I wanted to do, I wanted to write concert music, uh, but I also wanted to write uh, musical theater. And, and then as I grew older, I became a jazz musician. I, I think those of us who grew up during, in the baby boom generation, had an incredibly uh, democratic experience of music because they invented the LP. And so all of a sudden, any kind of music that ever was, you could, you could hear, finally, on, on, a, on a record. And so I just became imbued with all of these styles and, uh, and probably still have integrated them into um, uh, the theatrical world. Uh, you know, if you're doing an English show or a French show or an Italian show, uh, that and studying in college and then traveling all over the world. Uh, I guess that became my musical self. It, with uh, two things, one, uh, the influence of my grandfather, who was a cantor in a synagogue, so there's a lot of that. Actually, three things. My father, who was born and raised in London, and so this kind of English music hall from that, he taught me how to, we used to play ukulele duets and sing English music hall songs like, Don't Go Down to the Mines, Dad. Uh, and then, because he had his business in Montreal, he immigrated from London to Montreal to New Jersey, of all places. We would, uh, in the 1950s, we would um, vacation, and he would always take a, a, a house at, north of Montreal and Quebec in French Canada. And so I would hear Chevalier and Piaf coming out of the radio all the time, and people speaking French, and I think I must have thought I thought it was a French kid. And I think, and in Melody de Paris and in Folie Berger, I think there's a kind of a French aspect to my musical character, you might say. So all of that kind of got, got mushed together. But yes, I always knew I wanted to write for musical theater. So you, you, you said that you were influenced by lots of different styles. Lots of different, yeah. Is there any one particular style that you're really drawn to? Yeah, well, it started out really, it started out with Beethoven. Interestingly uh -huh. enough, when I was about eight or nine years old, my mother gave me the nine Beethoven symphonies, I think conducted by Bruno Walter, and that just became my Bible. And then, very early on, when I was about 10 years old, I wanted to learn what we called in the time popular music. <laughs> and, uh, and I changed piano teachers from a classical uh, musician to a guy from Bayonne, New Jersey. Uh, we, should, we, should give, we, should, we should give him the credit. His name, his actual name was Nat Glad. <laughs> and he played club dates. And you know, he brought me a fake book, and by the time I was 13 years old, I was playing club dates. I think what's useful about all that is that whatever I happen to be writing, I can write in the vernacular of what that subject matter is, or what that nationality is, or you know, one of my one of the great influences, or I should say, my heroes is Schubert, because he so very much gives the piano, makes the piano a character, and makes the piano able to describe what's what what's going on in, in the song, and uh, and I try to do that. Too. I try to tell the story in music. I think that's probably the most characteristic thing about me. I was influenced by all the great tone poems too, like uh, uh, like uh, uh, Don Quixote by Richard Strauss. You know, Strauss once said that he could show you, he could show, he could make you see knives and forks dancing on the table with music, and I believe that too. And and I think that uh, I think that's what I love about it: that uh, learning how to draw strength, descriptive strength, from music, so that even that part of it that isn't words is still telling you a story. So, if you're going to just listen to music for entertainment, what's your preferred choice of music? Oh, it, yeah, everything. I, 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 to, uh, the latest, just the latest, the latest hip thing that's going on to uh, early music from Leonin and Peratine of, of the 12th century. What do you think of rap? I love rap. I'm crazy for rap. Yeah, well, actually, you know, um, when I was uh, 
because of my background in jazz and African American music and folk music, I studied it at Yale and actually studied West African music with uh, uh, Robert Farris Thompson, who actually lived in West Africa. And, uh, and so when I got back from uh, two years at Cambridge in England, uh, and the war with the Vietnam War was on, uh, I got a fellowship to teach at, at a black college, uh, Lincoln University. And since they did not have an Afro-Am program, and I did know the history of jazz and African-American music, I, that was, I founded that course at Lincoln. And then when I went to do my PhD at Yale, I taught that course at Yale. You know, if you look at the history of, of Broadway music, it, it, it's ethnic composers, many Jewish composers, who were completely obsessed with African-American music, from Gershwin to Berlin, and, and I am too, you know. And so rap is, is just the latest iteration of what started as early jazz and Louis Armstrong and what became bebop and swing, and it'll never stop. Let's turn to Phantom. Okay. <laughs> well, how did you get started and get involved with Phantom? Well, you know, it's interesting. Most of what I write or what I've written is sort of author uh, author uh, initiated. I have an idea for nine or whatever. But in this case, Arthur Copen and I had, uh, had put nine the musical on Broadway and uh, we got a call from Jeffrey Holder, the wonderful uh, director. Uh, Timbuktu was one of his great, great uh, pieces on Broadway. And, um, and he said, look, I have, the I have the rights to this book by Gaston LaRue called Phantom of the Opera. And, and I, I, I'd never read the book, but I certainly had seen three or four different movies by that title over the years. So, uh, and uh, he said, I, I'd like you guys, I love your work, and I'd like you to consider writing a musical based on it. And uh, my first reaction was, it's a terrible idea. I mean, it's a horror movie. You know, Claude Rains gets, he's disfigured because somebody threw acid in his face and he jumps in the scent to wash it up. And I said, you know, what are we gonna do? Mothra meets Godzilla, the musical? And he said, well, you know what, read the book. And, and, and let's, let's have a meeting after you read the book. So I did read the book. It's a deeply romantic story that takes place in the 19th century. And when, I, when we came back, I said, you know, um, I think that this is an age when if you had a mad sister, you'd lock her up in the attic. And if you have somebody, if he's disfigured from birth, then they'd, they'd hide him in, in, in the crypt below the opera. Maybe his mother is a singer, or even if she isn't, that's what he's raised on. He hears so he, as horrible, uh, misshapen as he is on the outside, that's the beauty of him in the inside, and it's the beauty of, of music and of the great composers, you know, whether it's Wagner or Verdi or Mozart. And so somebody who, who is outwardly imperfect and inwardly illuminated with beauty, that's Quasimodo. Yeah. That's the elephant man. And, and who, and there's something universal about that because who among us doesn't understand in a way that despite our, despite our outward imperfections, inside, we're better, we mean well. We, and, and so I, I think there's something compelling and, 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 and universal about it. In fact, you know, now that I remember it, I think I saw The Elephant Man uh, with David Bowie. And I will never forget how, they, how David Bowie did it on Broadway. He, as, in, as somebody was describing the horrible tumors and, and awful misshapen things about him physically, Bowie was in a bright light wearing nothing but a loincloth and you know, with that pale, absolutely naked, terrifyingly pristine body and skin that he had. And that, and that tension and dissonance between the description of him as being so hideous and the beauty of David Bowie in, his, in, in the flower of his youth, wearing hardly anything. Um, I think that transfixing image was the one that made me realize that that's my guy, that's my phantom. And, and, I, and from there on in, we began to put together a story. So really, that, that idea doesn't exist in any of the other treatments, really, of phantom. No. This is sort of why, what that's makes it work as a musical for you. Right. I I'll tell you a funny story. Peter Stone, the wonderful author of 1776, good for, we were a Titanic together. He said to me once, yes, and how long are you going to live? And I said, what a terrible question. He said, no, no, we all don't live forever. And I said, can I be generous? And he said, yes. And I said, okay, I have the number. He said, right, divide by six, that's the number of musicals you can write. But they do take years and years and years. And so for me, if I'm going to commit myself to a show in that, that amount of time in my life, 
I have to answer several questions. The first is, why am I in this theater? Why do I care about this? What does this mean to me? And then, what about what I'm watching means something to me personally in my life? And if I can answer that question, then I know that at least it's worth it for me to be in the theater and watch it, and maybe somebody else will, will find something in it for themselves as well. And for this, that was the universal notion that I had had. And I realized, well, then if he lived, the only thing that makes, makes, it, makes it possible for him to live, then he, he's living in a, a horrible crypt. So what he would do is, if he's in the opera house, he'd steal the most beautiful scenery in the world after the, after, and bring it downstairs. So he would have the bed from Lohengrin, and he would have the, he would have the forest uh, from Pelias and Melisande. And so he'd have this wonderful environment. Despite his, his, his face and the mask he has in front of it, the glorious soprano voices and music wafting down through the crypts into his heart are like mother's milk to him. So all you have to do to create a story, to give him a problem is take that away, and then he has nothing but darkness. And so I figured, all right, well, fine. So the, per the person who runs the opera house is replaced by an awful woman with a terrible voice. Yeah, it's a perfect example of what's different about this day. Right. His world story. And now he has to find a voice. He has to find some beauty in it. And, uh, well, and what, I, what I adore about Arthur Copet is that he, he finds ways of, of, of putting humor in this tragic story. I mean, there's what, the, the one moment in the show when, when he's down in the crib and he hears the new woman vocalizing, he says to his uncle, the place really is haunted. <laughs> And, and it, always, it always gets a laugh. It always gets a laugh. It breaks that tension. That's just right. Enough That's right. So that he pulls the audience. He, in he is a guy. He's got a sense of humor. And, oh, and also that that he, the only danger to him is that if somebody sees him, and and so there always has to be something that starts a story. What happened? And what happened was, first first off, what happened was is that they they replaced the beautiful voice with a not beautiful voice, but worse, somebody has seen him. And he's not a murderer, but he had to kill him because otherwise he can't survive. And that's the first time he's killed. And, he, and it's a huge problem for him. But now everybody's looking for him. And of course, there's always, he's always made them think that there's a ghost down there so they, they would stay away. And so now he's got a problem. And, 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 and also, when he finally does see this girl and fall in love with her, uh, I think it's Steven Spielberg who once said, uh, "Well, it's a love story. What's the, you know, uh, you know, what, what's the obstacle?" And in this case, the obstacle is uh, uh, very obvious, and so that's the obstacle that they have to overcome. So, tell us a little bit about the writing process. What came first, the songs, the book? Uh, they come well, at the well same first time? of all, this story that I'm just telling you, that, the outlines of that story. So, the only way that a musical is going to happen is that Frank Lesser once said, uh, "This is the music business, and nothing in the music business happens without music." And it's a musical, and so it, it's it's my job as the composer to to answer the question: Does how does this sing? Where does it sing? How how where are those moments when we have to burst into song because we're so we're so moved with emotion we can no longer speak? I'll quote Frank Lesser again. He said very famously: um, Songs happen in musicals where exclamations happen in language. Some some songs begin with an exclamation: Oh, what a beautiful morning! And so, and so I start to find those places in the story. And so, for example, I, one of the first things I found was the notion that um, once he no longer has a beautiful voice that sustains him, he has to find one. And I got the idea for Where in the World? Where in the World? Find me another voice. And once I had put together, I think probably three or four or five songs together with the beginning of an outline of a story, I had enough to start a conversation with Arthur. And then two or three people, they, they sit together and you literally talk a show into existence. You know, you say, hey, you know, what about, what about this? What about that? Uh, I, um, I remember in the musical Titanic, I thought to myself, well, what if, what if the stoker is afraid that his um, girlfriend won't wait for him before he gets back, if he may marry somebody else? So he goes up in the middle of the night and gets the radio operator to propose to the girl and suddenly there's a song that, it, that never existed in the story of the ship, but suddenly it's there. And that kept happening with, especially kept happening in Phantom. Um, songs that, that weren't necessarily begun by the story, but became the story. I think I've learned, having written a lot of shows now, 
I find that the secret to writing musicals is that you're always fixing them. You're always fixing them, and you never really finish. Yeah, I always say musicals are never finished. Yeah. They're just produced. That's right. Well, and I, I, well, I think uh, uh, Robin said they're never finished. They're abandoned for lack of time. <laughs> uh, but and, and and you sort of never stop. You know, even now there are foreign productions in which there are cultural differences in which I'm able to make an adjustment in in the show. And and I mean, I've always said, you know, it's great to be a living author because you can you can do that. I constantly find when folks like you, who are very creative, show me things in the, sh in, the, in the show that I never even thought were there. So I keep learning. How did you go about getting the first production of that? I wrote, we, I wrote it fairly quickly, and so did Arthur, and, and Jeffrey was very enthusiastic about it. Um, but what he didn't know was that he only had the rights to that book for, uh, and, uh, for a short period of time because it went into the public domain. So all of a sudden, anybody could do a Phantom of the Opera. Well, fine, we, were, you know, we had our score by then. And in fact, we were doing backers auditions. I remember flying with Arthur and Jeffrey to uh, Santa Fe. And uh, we, uh, there was a, a bunch of investors there, and I remember playing, playing the score for them. And uh, we had a, a set designer who had, who had started to do some drawings. And then, um, and by the way, I find it's true in so many subject matters, you know, how many Cinderella's are there? How many Beauties and the Beasts are there? And in this case, there was a Ken Hill production in, in, in England. Uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber had seen that. Uh, he was fascinated with the story, and he announced that he wanted to write Phantom of the Opera. Uh, same thing happened to me when I started writing Titanic, and all of a sudden, here's this movie becomes a lot. Uh, we opened first there. But in any case, as soon as the word came that Andrew was interested in writing Phantom, because of you know the, I guess, uh, the nature of the business, and it is show and business, it's, it's two words, uh, a lot of, there were a lot of people in New York, and I don't blame them, who thought, well, how are we going to compete with a juggernaut like Andrew, who has had so many wonderful successes, and, uh, and so, you know, the bottom dropped out. So, uh, that had happened to me before, and it happened to me after, and that's part of, part of what we go through as creative people. My take on that is, is that no matter what I write, when I started writing Nine the Musical, I didn't have the rights to Fellini's Eight and a Half, and I never thought it was going to be um, produced. But I wrote it because it kept my pencil sharp. And you learn how to write by writing. And you have to write from wh where you get your best ideas that you love. So I thought, all right, fine. I've got a French story, because it was my intention to write something operatic, because we were in the opera. Write something French, because we're in Paris in the 19th century. And I loved Gigi. So, you know, so now I've got uh, the basis of, of a French 19th century score, and maybe one day there'll be another French 19th century story that I'll have, and I'll have some French operatic music in my trunk, and, you know, moving right along. And, I, you know, and, and, and soon after that, Placido Domingo asked me to write Goya for him, and suddenly I was writing a song about, a, 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 you know, a Spanish painter. And, and, and that was it. Uh, the Lloyd Webber... Uh, uh, Brilliant show, of course, had great success, the most successful show ever, actually. We knew that we didn't have a show. And what you do in a case like that is uh, you, you, you shake hands and you write a piece of paper that says, all right, you take the story, I'll take the score, and you know, maybe you can do something with the story, I'll do something with the score. Because you know, the truth is, is that when you're sitting together as a group of people and you're writing a show together, everybody has a name. That's the composer, that's the lyricist, that's the book writer. And once we know that, and we, you know, we make an agreement, then anybody, anybody who gets anything from any other department, they own. Right. Otherwise, everybody, everybody's going, I did that, I did that. So you can't, so I said, Arthur, you know, we wrote the book together, you gave me great ideas for the score. You take the book, I'll take the score. And uh, after the Lloyd Webber was successful on Broadway, Arthur, who was a wonderful writer, actually was asked to write a miniseries for, I think it was HBO, uh, and he did, and it was our story. I would say before that, a number of people had heard my score, uh, one of whom was a guy named Andrew, Andrew uh, uh, Kurovich, who's a, uh, uh, a critic, and he wrote an article for Connoisseur Magazine called uh, The American Masterpiece That Will Never Be Heard, <laughs> and something very nice about my score. And Frank Young, who ran Theater Under the Stars in Houston, read that and had heard about it through Jeffrey. And so he okay. said, I want to hear the score. And um, so uh, right here in, in New York City, he came, I was there with Arthur, and I played him the score. Uh, and I would say, in, in those the old days, the composer sat down and, and played, played, played the songs. 
And, uh, and he said, it's wonderful. He says, he, says, he says, I want to do it. I want to do it Theater Under the Stars. And I said, absolutely not. I, I have no interest in chasing a, 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 you know, a very estimable Andrew Lloyd Webber down the street. It's his show. You know, I can write my own shows. And besides which, people are going to come to the show thinking they're going to see that. They're going to be disappointed. You can't do that to them. And he said, no, he said, really, he said, I, I, will, I, will, I will spend a million dollars on this show, I really believe in it. He said, and I promise you, in all of our advertising, all of our press, and especially when we answer the phone, we will say, you know, we will make, pe make sure people understand uh, this caveat, this is not the Andrew Lloyd Webber Phantom of the Opera, this is a separate, independent, American musical theater piece that was actually begun before the Lloyd Webber even, even appeared. And I said, well, if you do that, and you're honest about it, and you don't fool people, I'd love to, sure, I'd love to see my work on stage. And so we, we got to work, and we found a wonderful uh, Ch Charles Abbott uh, to direct it, and we went to Houston. And he did give us a, a spectacular, with wonderful uh, uh, cast, and a wonderful set, a spectacular production of their show. And shockingly, uh, even at the first performance, I mean, there we were in Texas, and granite-hearted, Cowboys in in Texas were, were took out their bandanas or whatever they had and were just dabbing their eyes and everybody was crying and I thought well if you touch people like that it, it it's really worth doing and and it turns out that we had we had really written a show about fathers and sons and and really written a show about uh, about love and you know, unrequited love about about beauty and ugliness about yearning. Alan J. Lerner wrote in his, in his autobiography, uh, what moves him most is unrequited yearning. And, and for me, that's what, that's what this show is. We ache for these characters. We ache for the girl because she wants to love him. She wants to see, see his face. Or, and, so, and so that was a, that was a great, exciting moment. You know? and, and, and I figured, well, there we are. It's a curiosity. But. Um, we were given an opportunity uh, several months later to go to Seattle at the Fifth Avenue Theater and put the show on again. And at that point, we got to work on it and really hone it and, and refine it. And uh, it then became available for, uh, for licensing for theaters all over the country. And, and uh, one of the classic productions soon after that was Westchester Broadway Theater. And they had the same experience and their audience loved it uh, they just kept running it yeah, it ended up running nine months actually. It, nine months and, and uh, they've done it often since then and, and the critics took it to their hearts they, the, the reviews that we've gotten for it have been absolutely yeah, wonderful. the show always gets reviewed remarkably well. all over the country and uh, and, and it's interesting because it has it's developed its own brand that one of the people who really revolutionized um, Broadway productions Cameron McIntosh because you know he, he gets an image like the helicopter in Miss Saigon, and so that's that's on the marquee, and that's on on the playbill, and then he puts that on the cast album, and then you you know you sell the music, and so he put that on on the on the musical uh, uh, booklet, and then he puts it in his advertisement. So I thought, oh well, we we can do that. So I went to a wonderful uh, logo artist, his name is uh, 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 Frank Ferluzzo, uh, his nickname is Fravor. He's very well known for several things. One, he did The Lion King, mm. uh, which is extraordinary. He also did the famous Sunday in the Park with George logo in which they're dressed in the 19th century from the waist up and they're wearing jeans from the waist down. Yeah. Uh, and I said, can you, can you create an image very, very different from the one on Broadway that would be our show? And he did. And he had this idea of the phantoms, masked phantom being a, a candelabra, and there's a candle, and the flame, because, because Christine is light and passion, the flame is actually looks like Christine. And, 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 and there's a red candle wax coming down, and one drop of the candle wax is touched and becomes a tear on the phantom's cheek. And, and, the, and the, uh, I get the font is a sort of a Germanic, heavy, Gothic font. And I said, well, this is beautiful. And so we made, we made sure that that, was, that would be available to any theater that wanted to present the show. And when we published the music, 
uh, it's on the cover of the music. Then we realized that Broadway cast albums are enormously expensive. You have to pay everybody, I think, two or three uh, weeks of their Broadway salary just to do a Broadway cast album. But my show wasn't a Broadway show. And so you could pay actors scale. And because there was a production of Phantom right at Westchester Broadway Theater then, and it cost very, very little to do the cast album, and then we put the logo on the cast album. And suddenly, we had a logo, a brand, uh, you know, the, the, the Phantom logo. It was in everybody's ads all over the country. It was on the cast album from BMG. It, it was on the, on the vocal uh, book. And, and that brand went all over the world. Yeah, I think, do you know how many productions of Phantom there were? Sam French took out an ad congratulating us for a thousand productions. Wow. I'm sure there'd been more than that by now. I mean, well, here's the other thing. And this is not only Phantom. It ha it's happened with Nine the Musical, with Titanic. I mean, Nine was 36 years ago. Phantom is 1991. It's now 2018. And it gets produced more now than it did in the 90s. It's about to open in Japan in two different productions. And, and it's just been a hit in Korea. I'm pressed often to explain how is it possible. Uh, that some shows have that longevity, and I think the answer is probably the very earliest influence on me, which is which is classical music, because classical music never gets old-fashioned, because it has a, a rigidity and a structure and a, and a and a grammar to it. You can always listen to Bach or Mozart, and I think because my influence is structured that way, there's a huge difference between old-fashioned and and timeless. And I think there are musical elements of it, of the style that are timeless, so that it's just as hopefully relevant musically as now as it was in 1991. What really makes the show sing and work well? Uh, it's Beauty and the Beast. At the end of the day, that's the story. Yeah. Beauty and the Beast. Beauty, uh, you know, Beast loves beauty. One of the great universal stories yeah. of all time. And 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 it, if you do, if you don't ruin it, you know, it it it, it can work. And I think that every iteration of it has to be so specific. And the fact, for me, the fact that it is that it's a myth, because because any myth in any society has to has to find a way uh, of reconciling absolute opposite conceptions in a culture that are held at the same time. Uh, and uh, I felt that way about Titanic. Uh, on the one hand, we, we believe that we, from the Renaissance, man is at the center of the universe, the master of all things, right? Man can do anything and at the same time. So we still believe that. We have that Renaissance view of humankind. And, but we also have not 21st century of humankind, of which we're on a speck of dust, on a remote, nothing galaxy, and you know, one wave of the solar wind and we're, we're gone. And we hope, and so the Titanic was the apex of human accomplishment, and yet one wave, in the irrational universe, and so we tell that story over and over again. And in the case of Phantom, it, it's, it's precisely this reconciling of, 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 the, of what's worst and hideous within us or can be, and, and the saving grace of our capacity for love and beauty and kindness, and, and, uh, and, and taming what's wild in us and becoming civilized, and I think we all have that within us. Maury, it's a remarkable show, and I'm thrilled to be able to be directing it again. Oh my God, I'm so happy that you are. And, I, I just, uh, I cannot wait to see it. Right. And, and, I, and I know you have a great cast. My last question for you is, Sure. do you ever think that this phantom will find its way to Broadway? Never. Oh, I would never allow it. Because you just feel it's, it's We its think thing. it's the greatest hit up never to play Broadway. One of the great things I've learned is that we've become a non-Broadway-centric world. It used to be, when I was growing up, Broadway was where all the new things are. Regional theaters would be doing, you know, copies of, copies of, copies of what had been on Broadway. Now, Broadway is doing revival after revival after revival, or, or you know, or I guess uh, jukebox musical, which is pre-existent stuff, right? And the real action is happening out in the regions where they're doing new, where the new exciting things are being done, like Phantom, which was created in the region. So no, I don't. I, I don't see. I don't see. There's any point in going yeah, to Broadway. Need to. No, I want to write Broadway. I want to write new shows for Broadway. Yeah. Well, Maury, thank you very oh, much. Oh no, for thank you very much. This is. I love speaking. I look forward to seeing you. I, I can't night. wait to see the show up at Westchester Broadway. It's just very exciting. To me.